Okay. This is, by the way, taken from my favorite line in the Incredibles movie. The, they're in a bar, it's like, we're superheroes, we save the world. Why do we have to keep doing this over and over again? Um, so I know I'm here as the, the, the light dinner entertainment, uh, and I promise to be short, uh, but I do want to start by saying uh, just how serious and important the work that all of you are doing is. Uh, there's really no other way to describe the profession of teacher than saving the world. Um, and, and I really do mean that very literally. Our world is extremely complicated. There's airplanes flying overhead, there's power plants, there's doctors, there's all this stuff going on. And with every new generation, we have to have an entirely new set of these people coming online or the whole place will just fall apart. Uh, and this has happened before in other parts of the world. It absolutely can happen here. Uh, and the only line of defense that we have, the only line is teachers. There's nothing else that saves us from the fact that we have to replace all of those people who know how to do all of those complicated things. Um, which makes it somewhat scary that the profession of teaching, I think, is changing now more than it ever has, uh, ever, really. And so I'm, I'm always very skeptical when people say that things are different now, um, especially anything involving raising kids, because kids really haven't changed a lot in a very, very long time. Um, uh, but I think that there is one thing that has actually changed that is unique in our time. And, that is the change in our relationship to information. And it, it is really just in the last 10 or 15 years that we have exited the age of information scarcity and entered an age of ubiquitous information. Um, many people say too much information. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, pretty much any sort of a, a question that you have, if it has a straightforward factual answer, um, I don't know if you can read that or not, but um, you know, if, if it has an answer, you can find that answer. Even a child can find it, especially a child. Um, because you know, the, the kids today are, are growing up with the idea that there are no questions that can't be answered. You know, you Google it. Uh, and sometimes there is no answer, and that gets interesting. Um, uh, and it's not just facts that are instantly accessible. So my company's Wolfram Alpha Service, uh, and a free online website, uh, will do an incredible range of computations for you. Real world calculations, statistics, things involving data. Um, I'm just, just one example I put up here is integrals. It is absolutely the best, most powerful system for computing integrals that exists anywhere. Any integral which there is a known technique for doing, it will simply do it. Uh, it'll show you the steps if you need that for your homework. Um, and by the way, if there's, if there's any teachers here who are not familiar with Wolfram Alpha, I promise you that your students are, and you might want to check it out. Um, Google has fundamentally changed people's relationship to information. Wolfram Alpha, I think, has fundamentally changed people's relationship to computation and problem solving. Um, but it's not just resources like that. There's things like the Khan Academy. If a kid wants to learn something, they can go out there, they can find a little three minute video that will teach it to them. If they want to go to a, a higher level, there's things like MIT OpenCourseWare and many things like this. Um, my company has its own education portal, if I can put in a small plug. Um, we have curriculum materials available in our computable document format, nice interactive things. There's now you know, textbooks, online textbooks that use our interactive CDF technology. Um, the problem, uh, here is no longer access to information. There's like way more information that you could ever possibly want. It's all there, it's available, it's accessible. Um, uh, and this is, you know, this is opening up new ways of approaching education. You can acquire information much more on demand rather than having to kind of cram it all in during a, a, an educational process. Um, you know, even facts that you haven't, that aren't part of the field that you studied, that are now available. Uh, and this is, this is created, I think this, this is largely responsible for the, 
the sort of incredible acceleration of progress that we've seen in the last decade or two, um, you know, products getting smarter, people applying uh, scientific and technical solutions to things that used to be kind of seat of the pants problems. Um, this is very helpful, of course, to a company like Wolfram Research because we sell our computational software, uh, software that's used to apply scientific methods and, and mathematical models and things to lots of different products. We can only sell that stuff to people who know how to use it. Um, and you know, the ability of people to sort of pick up information rapidly is, is uh, you know, having a major effect in the world in many ways. Um, there's just one problem with this. Uh, an awful lot of this is happening outside the United States. And, uh, you know, th this is not a good thing. Uh, public support for science in the United States, belief in its power and effectiveness, are really not doing so well. Um, and the problem isn't, an access, isn't, isn't accessing information, it's a lack of desire to access information or access to disinformation. Um, uh, and this is, this is really bad for business. Uh, get my stash of water here. <clears throat> it's, it's bad for business. It's bad for the United States. It's bad for my company. Uh, terrible for our competitiveness in the world. Um, you know, we like to sell tools that use reality-based solutions, math, physics, computation. We need scientists and engineers in order to sell our products to them. Uh, so uh, this brings me to sort of a little detour uh, in my life. Uh, this, this whole problem was something that I never really concerned myself with when I was uh, you know, enmeshed in the building of software and making these tools and, and uh, all that. Um, but somewhere around 2003, kind of really quite by accident, uh, I found myself writing a monthly column for Popular Science Magazine, um, mostly about chemistry. Um, and it's kind of a long and twisted story how that happened, but it really, it really wasn't my intention to do that. It certainly wasn't my intention to keep doing it for the next 10 years, um, but I did. Uh, and I kind of started to feel responsible and uh, found myself in this position of being a person who communicates science to a lot of people who read that magazine and who don't get a lot of science elsewhere. Uh, they may not have a very good science program in their school, it's fairly typical. Um, and uh, so what I wanted to tell you about was uh, some of the things that I found um, that have worked for me in addressing this question of how do you communicate to people why science is a useful and interesting thing that they ought to maybe pay some attention to. Uh, and these are things that have, that have kind of worked for me and I don't know, you know, maybe they're of interest to other people. And there's basically two things. Uh, that I've found that, that, that are useful and interesting, uh, which are exemplified by these kind of two branches of, of my work, Popular Science Column and the Elements Book. So the first method is to explain something that people recognize in their world, something that they've noticed and maybe don't really understand, and show how they can understand it using uh, something that you can explain to them in a scientific sort of a way. And this was something that my first editor at Popular Science always insisted on, that I'm not allowed to write about anything unless I can tell him why is this relevant to somebody's everyday life. It's not good enough to just be, you know, a cool demonstration or something fun or whatever. No, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, uh, it has to be relevant. It has to mean something. It has to explain something and answer a question that somebody already had. So here, this is a perfect example of this. Um, uh, hydrogen soap bubbles. This is a fabulous demonstration. I'm going to let the video play. If the, I don't know if the AV people, if the sound on this is too loud, uh, you can, if you can turn that, wait a minute, I can turn that. We don't really need to hear that too much. You're just going to watch it. Um, so this, this is a, it's a standard chemistry demonstration. It's a marvelous thing. You blow hydrogen gas into soap bubbles and then you run after it with a candle. Uh, and you get these, uh, these beautiful jellyfish. Um, and I wanted, I spent a year trying to convince him to let me write about this topic, and he wouldn't because I couldn't tell him, well, what, you know, you don't run into this in everyday life, at least most people don't. Um, and I finally figured out that the answer is propane, because uh, if you live in the Midwest and you live out on the farm, uh, you have propane for heat, 
You have a tank out back and it's got propane gas. And every year in the newspaper you will read about somebody who came home from vacation and they found the roof of their house in the basement and the walls were spread out in the fields. Um, they're always on vacation. Very few people are ever hurt in these things. Um, and what's happened is that there was a propane gas leak somewhere in their house. If they'd been home, they would have smelled it because they put chemicals in to make sure that you smell. But they weren't home. And the propane is heavier than the air, and it sinks, and it collects in the basement, and it kind of mixes up with the air, and slowly rises up until it eventually hits a pilot light or some other source of ignition. And then there's a tremendous explosion. And the question is, why does propane burn, on the one hand, gently and safely in your stove or your furnace, and on the other hand, blows your house to bits uh, uh, in other circumstances? And the hydrogen bubbles, um, if you were watching, you noticed they went um, between burning kind of slowly when the hydrogen had to mix with air as it was burning because it was pure hydrogen in the bubbles versus exploding like a gunshot. And it's, it's really loud. I mean, it literally is like a shotgun going off next to your ear when you pre-mix it with oxygen because then you have the oxidizer and the fuel mixed together ahead of time and there's nothing that limits the rate, and you have a very fast explosion. So that way of connecting to something that was you know, relevant, let me write about that. So here's another example. Diamonds, you know, diamonds are forever, right? Everybody knows diamonds are forever. Uh, but no, they're not. Diamonds are flammable. Um, this is a, an example of how to burn a diamond. So uh, I'm pouring some liquid oxygen into a little graphite crucible, and then I have a diamond that's a little piece of cheap diamond I got on eBay. Uh, and I'm lighting it with a hydrogen torch, an oxyhydrogen torch, um, and it will just burn. Uh, it, they're not forever. It, it's, it's a ridiculous notion. It was invented by the diamond companies. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's interesting to kind of illuminate one of these little lies that people have lived with. Um, uh, that's an example of a cubic zirconia. Uh, so it turns out the cubic zirconia that you get at Walmart is, is in fact much more forever than diamonds. It's almost indestructible. Um, anyway, so I think in the interest of time, I think we'll skip this one. So this, this was a little public service one that I did, why you should always thaw your turkey before you deep fry it. Uh, which again is, you know, it's, a, it's an everyday thing. You read about the people burn their houses down all the time with these turkey fryers. It's a, basically a five gallon pot of hot oil but the question is, why can you have a five-gallon pot of hot oil um, and it doesn't catch fire? It's there. It's open in the air. There's, the top of the pot is open. And yet, if you put the turkey in it wrong, you get this amazingly beautiful fireball. Um, <laughs> and it's to do with surface area and volume. And it's, if the oil becomes finely divided, mixed with the air, then it becomes extremely flammable. Uh, whereas if you just have it in a pot, you can point a blowtorch at it and it won't light. Um, and so that's, that's a, again, an example of a, um, you know, a, a way of using science to explain something that people may have heard about or read about. Um, so this, this is the, um, the book. This is five years of collected columns. We're at, right now working on the second edition because I'm now up to almost 10 years. Um, and uh, this, this is actually a good example of... Uh, the kind of science book that you don't really want to get for use in schools, the subtitle, <laughs> but probably shouldn't, uh, is meant very much to be taken seriously. Um, this, this was one of my favorite columns uh, that didn't make it into the first book, but will be in the second edition of the book. This is a, a device constructed entirely of bacon, which cuts steel. Um, and here's the video. Let me turn the uh, gas on and light it. Uh, and of course, what it's doing is it's burning the bacon fat in a stream of oxygen. And it, it's a, an illustration of why oxygen and oxidizers are really important in bus trip. Um, how many people know what the Saturn V moon rocket ran on? What was the fuel in the Saturn V? Anybody? It's diesel fuel, kerosene, basically. The same thing that your, your average truck runs on. The difference is that the oxidizer in a Saturn V is liquid oxygen uh, versus air. Uh, it's nothing to do with the fuel, it's the oxidizer. And this, this demonstrates that you can cut steel with bacon if you have the right oxidizer. Um, so uh, that's the first mess. It explains something in the world that people 
already care about. Second method is harder. This is get people interested in something that they didn't realize was interesting. Um, and it, it's harder, but it's more satisfying, and I think it's more valuable, because if you, can, if you can show somebody that they are actually interested in a topic that they thought was boring, it makes them feel good about themselves, and it kind of makes them think maybe they ought to look into this science stuff a bit more uh, and see if there's other interesting things that they might find out. Uh, and so that's, the, uh, that's what I ended up doing with this, this Elements book. I mean, um, periodic tables, right? This, this is not one of the more dynamic topics that, you know, if you go out in the street and you ask people, would you like to read a book about elements and the periodic table, they'll probably say, well, no, of course not. Why would I want to do that? Um, because they probably had a relatively bad experience about it in school. And, you know, and so I kind of, I didn't exactly set out to change this. That would be uh, projecting back motives that didn't really exist. I just had a bunch of pictures and wanted to make a book. Um, but so I made this book and it has lots of pictures and it has lots of stories. Um, uh, so like on silicon, for example, is one of my favorite little stories. Uh, I talk about artificial life. You know, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know about how they have silicon-based life forms in Star Trek, and they point out that there's a chemical similarity uh, between silicon and carbon, and that silicon can form long chains of long chain molecules somewhat the way that carbon can. Um, but I point out that this is actually not the way that's, that artificial life based on silicon is going to come about. It will be because of microchips and electronic circuitry if we end up with artificial life. It'll be because of its electronic properties, not its chemical properties. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I kind of go off on sidetracks in the book. Um, lots of pictures. Gold is a pretty element, so it gets two whole pages. Um, and uh, so another thing that um, many people probably didn't realize when I published this book in print form is that I actually had photographed all of these objects on a turntable rotating around a complete circle. Um, so I could do something like that, uh, which is really hard to do on paper. You have to like pick one picture to print, and that's annoying. Um, um, but then Steve Jobs kind of descended, as he does sometimes, and gave us the iPad, which was this wonderful device that one could sell books on in electronic form. Um, so we turned a print book into an electronic book where everything is moving. The pages look kind of similar, but everything is moving and alive. And you can, if it's an actual iPad, you can take your finger and spin them. Uh, so, you know, this book has done pretty well. And it surprised me. It surprised my publisher. Uh, it, frankly, it's, I think, blown both of us away in terms of how many copies it's been able to sell. And I think it's because it showed people that, you know, this is actually interesting. You may not have realized it, but you're actually smart enough to understand this stuff, and you find it interesting. And that makes, like I said, makes people feel good about themselves. Uh, and might help, you know, next time a scientist comes along and says, I've got something interesting for you to look at, the person might be a little more inclined. Uh, and this, this actually, this, this sort of activity of scientists of trying to make themselves seem more interesting uh, has a very long history. Right back, this is a, a, a painting, I suppose, of uh, one of the very first public demonstrations of science, Christmas chemistry show, uh, and I believe that's Michael Faraday, or it may have been Humphrey Davy, but anyway, all of these people, all of the first generation of scientists, the first people who called themselves scientists, were also showmen and public speakers, and they had to, you know, invent the profession of science, which they did, and then they had to figure out why on earth anybody should pay them to do this job that they'd invented for themselves, and so they put on shows, and they convinced the British public, and in turn, the King of England, that he should establish the Royal Society and he should give them a bunch of money. And then they went about doing useful things, like inventing things that saved coal miners and uh, you know, steam engines and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and they proved their worth. But they had to, you know, they had to go out and sell themselves first. Um, and that's, you know, that's an activity that continues to this day. Uh, and so if we had a second little shameless plug here for uh, my current activities, uh, Touch Press, we're a company that publishes books that try to do basically this. We try to make people interested in stuff that they didn't realize they were interested in. Um, you know, science, solar system elements, poetry. I never knew I was interested in The Wasteland, which is a rather obscure poem by T.S. Eliot, but it turns out it's great uh, if you have the right, you know, material. Um, so now uh, I put this slide in here. Um, uh, not to be a gratuitous Dune reference, but to remind me to tell you about 
my tooth. So I had sort of a, a semi-emergency root canal actually just on Monday. Um, and, uh, and today is the first day that it's not hurting, so you're lucky. This could have been a really bad talk. Um, <laughs> But I realized while, while the doctor was there drilling that she's like a lot younger than me. And uh, you know, this I suppose is a sign of aging that my doctor is now 10 years younger than I am. Um, but it made me think just how thankful I am that somebody decided to uh, you know, become a doctor, decided to study all that they had to uh, and get a good education and learn the science and everything else that you need to become a doctor, or a dentist in this case. Um, and it made me think how much I hope that other people will also do this and will follow in, in, in their, her footsteps and become doctors and engineers so that, you know, when I'm old, really old, uh, there will be doctors there to drill my teeth and there will be engineers there to uh, make sure that there's power to run those drills um, because without all that it would be really miserable. Uh, and I don't want to live in that world where this has all kind of fallen apart. Um, uh, so. You know, what I basically want to say by that is thank you all here for working to try to make sure that there will always be people to drill my teeth uh, and make sure that we don't have to live in the sort of miserable world that we will if, you know, if the enterprise of science education doesn't work. So thank you very much.